Hi guys, good morning. Uh, guys, we'll wait for a few minutes as we are expecting more participants to join. I repeat, we'll wait for more uh, for five minutes as we are expecting more participants to join the webinar. Thank you. Uh, guys, those who have connected just now, please note we are waiting for more participants to join the webinar. I repeat, those who have connected just now, please note we are waiting for more participants to join the webinar.
uh, guys, still the time we are starting up with a uh, full day training on DP two not three. Uh, you all can go and follow us on our social media platforms to get the updates on upcoming webinars and training which we do. I have shared the social media platform links in the chat box for you all. So you can go and follow us on our social media platforms. Okay, so we are good to start with the training, full day training on DP203 certification. So, hello, you all. Myself, Chaitali, your host for this webinar. So, if you have any doubt or questions throughout the session, like this full day training, you can use the chat window and you can ask your queries. Uh, participants are not allowed to. To use the mic, if you have any question, you can ask it in the chat box. Then talking about our today's event sponsor, Synergetics. So Synergetics, as you all know, is one of a kind corporate learning solution company. Uh, we do provide certification trainings as well as trainings on solutions like onboarding add-on solution, so persona-based onboarding solutions. Certification solution, certification plus add on solution, latest technology training solution, and emerging technology training solution. Then, what does Microsoft certification training do? Uh, it will give you a complete learning experience. You will get, uh, get trained. Build confident to, to appear for the exam and get certified. That is, get recognized. Then we have journey path. Like how you can go for the advanced certification once you complete the fundamental training. 
this is the journey path here you can see we do provide advanced paid training at minimum cost for that you have to first complete the fundamental training and then you can go and opt advanced certification uh, the advanced certification training includes mentoring recorded sessions practice labs exam prep practice test for the certification then you you can go and appear for the certification exam and get certified then here you can see the benefits of getting certified benefits to your organization you can shift from unstructured learning to structured learning uh, build the competitive advantages for the organization adding profit to the business and enhance brand reputation and more then how you can advance yourself so this is the scaling journey of the microsoft certification first you have to complete the fundamental certification then you can go for advanced role based and expert level certification we do provide paid trainings on fundamental advanced role based and expert level certification as you can see on the screen in fundamental certification we do provide certification training on az900 that is as your fundamentals then ai900 as your ai fundamental dp900 as your data fundamental pl900 power platform fundamental and sc900 security compliance and identity fundamental so this certifications comes under fundamental certifications and we do provide training on the same then we do provide trainings on az104 that is azure administrator associate then we have az204 azure developer associate ai102 azure ai engineer associate dp203 azure data engineer associate and more then the expert level certification az305 azure solution architect expert then we have sc100 under expert level that is cyber security architect expert then pl600 power platform solution architect expert and az400 devops engineer expert so if you want to get certified or you want training on certifications which i have mentioned you can connect with us to know more about the certification then our certification offerings so certification will help you to increase your visibility or uh, expand your knowledge and your skills we do provide certifications on add-ons onboarding add-ons like short duration modules and more then going ahead today's training is organized by atc community that is azure tech community so our atc community is open to all the people who are interested in our cloud technologies and various emerging uh, technologies like artificial intelligence machine learning open source iot cloud and devops you can follow our communities uh, the communities are emerging technology community for all then we have azure tech community pune for pune kers emerging technology community surat for surat tech and azure tech community nagpur for nagpur stores so you just need to install the meter app on your phone or on your device to get the communities followed you will get an update regarding the trainings webinars workshop which we do on the following communities i will be sharing the community links in the chat box for you all then code of conduct 
uh, as you all know, no one is allowed to take the screenshot of the presentation throughout the training, and you cannot do the screen recording. We will be sharing the recordings on our official YouTube channel. To access the recording, you have to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I will be sharing the YouTube channel link as well in the chat box. Then today's speaker for this full day training on DP203 is Mr. Chandrasekhar Deshpande. He is an MCT, Microsoft Certified Trainer, and currently works with Synergetics as practice. The agenda for this webinar, you will get to know more about the certification, which is DP203 certification and the benefits. Regarding you will get to learn and uh, get to learn more about the certification and learning path journey explanation will be done and the training. Then we will be sharing a complimentary learning achievement batch for the DP203 certification. Uh, you just have to follow certain steps to get your batch activated. So in this batch, you will get a study material, an overview of the modules and journey path. For that, you have to make sure you follow these steps and get your batch activated. These steps and the URL to get your batch activated will be provided to you all in the chat box later on. So make sure you do redeem the batch and get activated your DP203 certification batch then do follow us on our social media platforms like linkedin facebook a youtube channel and twitter to know more about the upcoming certification training and webinars the links will be provided to you all in the chat box so you all can go and follow our social media platforms that's all from my side. Now I would like to hand over the mic to CB sir, so you can go ahead with this training. Thank you. Thank you, Shatali. <coughs> Good morning, uh, everybody. On this one day session on DP203. And in this session, as uh, Chetali already set an agenda, first of all, I will say uh, to you. Uh, different ways of preparing for the examination. Then we will take an overview of the curriculum. I will take you through some of the some labs also. And by the end of the session, we will uh, go through some of the sample questions so that you will get idea uh, and the level of the complexity of the questions that we'll be asking the examination. <coughs> So uh, I'm sharing my screen and I would like to know whether my audio and uh, screen is reaching to everybody. You can raise your hands. I'm sharing my screen. Whether my audio and uh, screen is reaching to everybody here. Yes, sir. OK. OK, uh, that's fine. I think. Uh, you can take your hands down. So here we are going to talk about uh, DP203 certification. DP stands for uh, data processing. And this certification is actually centric to uh, some of the Azure based data, uh, data processing centric services like Synapse Analytics. This certification also talks, may not be at length, but uh, uh, a part of it also talks on Databricks. So, Databricks is also a service available on Azure. We call it the Azure Databricks. Okay, so Azure Synapse Analytics and Azure Databricks, these are the two uh, services. Uh, this certification curriculum talks about.
So here we will quickly go through uh, how is the weightage distribution uh, across the multiple functional parts in this curriculum. The whole curriculum has been divided into three modules. Design and implement data storage, which carries 15 to 20 percent weightage. And this particular module is you know, foundation for remaining two modules. So even if it's a weightage is less, it is good in case if you do it uh, thoroughly. Because all basic concepts, fundamental concepts, this module carries uh, um, uh, to understand uh, details of the module two as well as of module three. In module two, we will talk about developed data processing, and this is the most important module here, okay, which carries around uh, 40 to 45 percent of weightage. And then comes the module three, which talks about security, monitoring, optimizing data storage, and data processing, so which carries around 30 to 35 percentage of the uh, weightage. So here we will take an overview of uh, uh, all the features of the Synapse Analytics, and I will take you uh, to take an overview of even data breaks also. In order to do the preparation for the examination, now it is essential to understand the pattern of the examination before we go for uh, discussion on features of the Synapse Analytics, before we go on discussion on different points in the curriculum. Here, examination is MCQ type and only MCQ type. So there is no practical or descriptive examination. But in this examination, there are two types of questions, single choice or multiple choice. Single choice questions certainly are simple to uh, answer and that's why they carry less weightage. Multi choice questions obviously carry more weightage. There may be few simulation type of questions where virtual machine, uh, virtual Azure portal is made accessible. Uh, no, this particular was, I will have to remove this point. Okay, uh, yes, they tried to introduce it and in one of the examinations they did introduce it, but now this is not available there. Okay, so there is no practical like questions as on today. So I'm removing that. Radio buttons means single choice and checkbox means multi choice. Multi choice question certainly carries multifold weightage that I already told you. No negative marking from where we can con say confirm whether there is a negative marking or not. That also I will tell you. Okay, and I will request everybody uh, before you go for any Microsoft or Azure examination, you know, just go there and verify that there is no negative marking. But in case if there is no negative marking, obviously it is recommended that you do attend every question, attempt every question. Attempt every question, apply your logic, find the best possible answer and attempt every question. Total passing score is. OK, total passing score is 700 out of 1000. So. There will be around you know, 45 to 55 questions. Their total weightage is 1000. And you have uh, a score at least of 700 to successfully pass the examination. Total exam duration is 150 minutes. So 150 means two and a half hours. Including you know, joining 15 minutes early and post examination staying there for 15 minutes. So actual examination time is of 120 minutes. So you have to join 15 minutes early or sometimes you know you, even you should join 30 minutes early to uh, complete all uh, joining processes, authentication processes. OK, and when you start the examination, the total duration of the examination is of 120 minutes. OK, within 120 minutes you have to attempt uh, 45 to 55 questions. So on an average, if I consider there are 50 questions, you know, uh, 50 questions you will have to attain attempt in 120 minutes. So around more than two uh, minutes you get for uh, for every question to attempt. Okay. There are two types of two groups of questions. I will not say types of questions. There are two groups of questions. 
the first group of question you know is not interdependent every question you know is uh, i will say it's a, it has its own problem statement and in order to uh, answer the another question you know this problem statement in way will not help you every question will have its own problem statement so every question will be different and not at all interdependent there is another set of question where you may get around five to eight questions and that set of question you know is shown to you uh, after you attempt uh, the first group of questions so first group of question will have around uh, 35 to 38 questions after you attain that first group of questions then the second group of questions will begin and remember once you submit the first group of questions you cannot come back to it so once you go to the second group of question you know you cannot come back to the first group of question uh, and change the answers that is not possible so you have to be very careful that whenever you are finally doing a final submission of first group of question you know uh, you have to ensure that there is uh, there is no reason for you to come back and uh, try to correct your answer so you may want to revisit the questions you do that whatever you want to do you know you do that but once you do final submission then and once you leave this group then you cannot come back to this group. the another group will have around five to eight questions but those are all case study based questions so there will be one case study given and based on the case study statement there will be five to eight questions uh, asked to you now this case study is a longer one okay and it has been divided into multiple pages okay and there you simply have to uh, you know whenever uh, you are attempting a question you know while reading the question if you want to go back to the case study that is possible so it's not a case that once you read the case study then you cannot come back so case study is always shown to you in the uh, one part of the uh, screen and in the another part of the screen uh, question will be asked to you whenever you want to switch between case study and a question you can do it easily so that is possible three types of questions exam begins with uh, individual questions there are few questions on small problem statement now uh, here again i need to do the correction you know there are only two types of questions two types of questions okay this type of question uh, there are few questions on case study. It's not a problem statement, but a case study. Case study statement. On which solution is given, and you are expected to agree or disagree. Uh, no, on, uh, on which it is a solution is not given here. Okay, on which questions will be based. Questions will be based. Okay. Uh, yes, that is the pattern of the examination. You can appear for the examination from. Uh, you can choose the location from where you want to appear for the examination. Okay, and uh, since this pandemic, uh, many of us are uh, preferring appearing for the examination from the home. Okay, so you can appear for the examination from the home. Now, in case if you are planning to appear it from the home. You, know, you will get uh, lots of choices of time uh, time uh, time slots and in case if you are choosing to you know go to the uh, pro matrix center to appear for the examination then very limited choices are available there as per the convenience of the pro matrix center okay so you can whenever you are scheduling the examination you know there you can choose uh, from where you want to appear for the examination and then they will ask you which time slot do you want to select? OK, and you can select the time slot also. Must maintain complete. Now, uh, one more very important point to mention here. In case if you are appearing for this examination for the first time, you know, it is very important to uh, know that you have to maintain a complete decorum of the examination, even if you are appearing it from your home. So must maintain complete decorum of the examination without anybody around. No sound, no second laptop uh, around you. 
mobile phones must be away at the arm's distance. And whenever I say nobody around you, it means you have to lock your room from inside and even your family members also should not be allowed to come in. Remember, throughout the examination uh, duration, somebody uh, will keep monitoring, uh, monitoring you. Somebody will keep monitoring uh, ambience around you. So that you have to keep uh, your video on, you have to keep your audio on. OK, so there must not be even whispering sound around you. OK, and yes, that care uh, uh, is monitoring uh, people. You know, they will always take OK, and they will ensure that you are appearing for the examination with uh, appropriate decorum, examination decorum. Audio and video must be on as the proctors. The proctors are the people who are mo monitoring you. OK, and they will even do not allow you to look outside the screen. So your eyeball movements also are being monitored there. Your lip movements are also monitored there. And whenever they feel like you know, there is something unusual, unusual eyeball movements, unusual lip movements, they definitely point out, to, uh, point out, uh, point it out to you. Laptop can be used for the examination, must pass all the hardware tests before you go for the examination. So whenever you schedule the examination, you will receive one mail. And in that mail, you know, there will be hyperlinks provided. You know, you will have to, you know, get your <coughs> laptop validated. OK, by clicking on those hyperlinks. So those hyperlinks will uh, validate whether your video is working properly with our audio. OK, and it will also uh, validate the Internet speed. So these three things are very important for uh, examination to go successfully. OK, so it will validate uh, those three things. Regular workshops are being arranged by us. We are arranging workshops uh, uh, for this certification. And in this certification, we are covering all the modules. That is one thing. And another thing is we will also provide you a practice environment. The skill level labs will be provided to you. OK, and where you can, you know, complete the labs and can have, you know, good hands on. Now, see. Though it is MCQ based examination, hands on are very important for the reason that you know there are around uh, 40 uh, percent questions are based on uh, hands on and concept, uh, say concepts and hands on. So hands on, you know, giving significance to doing the hands on is very important here. So we arrange uh, workshops for this, and there we also provide you uh, a scalable labs where you can do your hands on, you can do your practice, OK, and you can get up and ready for the examination. So here are some of the URLs are given from where you can schedule your examination. That is one thing and there study pages are also available. So first of all, let me share this URL with you in the chat box OK, and we will refer to that URL hereby to uh, understand more what are all different. Uh, you know, Study arrangements they are giving us. Okay, so I am clicking on that hyperlink which I already have shared with you. Okay, and when I click on the hyperlink, it will take me to. Let me click on that hyperlink. It will take me to this page. Now on this page. OK, this is all the, this page is uh, referring to all the details of this examination, and this is very important page uh, for you for going for the examination. At one place, you will get lots of information about the examination as well as there is an online learning material available on this page. So here you will see. There are a couple of tips. I will I will visit this tip a little later. OK, there are a couple of ticks. There is a way to schedule the examination. Whole page has been divided mainly in three parts. So in this part, you will get more information about the examination. I will take you to that uh, information. From here, you can schedule your examination. OK, and here if you mention India. OK, so it will uh, give you uh, examination fees in Indian rupees. 
Okay, and the third part talks about pages. From here, you can visit the pages. Okay, and this is online study material available. Okay, here is the online study material available. So a whole page has been divided into three parts. Now let us visit uh, these parts one by one. So first of all, I will take you uh, to study guide. So here it is. So I am right clicking over there. Okay, in case if you two have opened this page, you know, uh, uh, follow me please, and you two click there. Okay, you will uh, land on this page, and on this page, uh, here are a couple of very important uh, hyperlinks available. So here is the exam scoring and school concepts. This is important uh, uh, URL. I'm opening it in the new tab. And here you will observe. Information regarding the examination. OK, it, it has been given. Okay. So here you can see. What is the minimum score of passing? OK, that has been given there. OK. Uh, you will also get a report with your exam score and feedback on your performance and that you will get within five ten minutes of, uh, after you uh, do a final submission of your examination so here what you will do you will appear for the examination and after you do final submission within next five minutes you know, it shows your score it shows the result of the examination and also it shows uh, the performance it uh, you know, mentions which area you need to improve upon. OK, which area you are you may be weak in. OK, and you which area you may be strong in. So even feedback of the performance also is shared within next five minutes. Huh. OK. No points are deducted. For correct answer. This is very important point. You should verify before you go for any examination. OK, so there is no negative marking and that is the, you know, the reason that I can recommend you to attempt each and every question. Do not leave any question unattempted. Okay, attempt each and every question. Uh, yes, more information regarding the examination. You can expect more information regarding the examination here on this page. So let me take you to the next URL now. So it is a sandbox. I'm opening it. OK, and this is also very important uh, URL. And I will recommend everybody to go to the sandbox to experience exact examination environment. So let me open it. And here you will understand what type of questions are asked in the examination. What is the look and feel of uh, an examination portal? OK, and here uh, some of the OK uh, do's and don'ts are given. Copying an examination or exam related information in any form or by any means you know, that is not allowed. That can be counted as a misconduct OK in the examination. So you quickly uh, read this uh, uh, these points. Uh, to you know, uh, to take care that you will not go against any of these points. OK, and you have to approve that you have already understood them. OK, and you are agreeing, you are accepting. I click on yes. OK, examination clock is yet yet not started. Whatever you can see here to the right side, you know, that is not an examination clock. OK, so I am clicking on the next. Examination name that will appear here. And then uh, total number of questions uh, in the examination. Ideally, uh, uh, the number uh, like uh, 45 to 55, that number it has to show. OK, total duration of the examination. Ideally, it should show you 120 minutes or two hours, whatever it be. OK, number of case studies. So ideally, it should show you one okay, because these days only one case study. 
uh, they are giving. Okay, maximum time for the examination. So again here. Uh, so uh, here it has to show you 150 minutes total duration of the examination 150 minutes and maximum time of the examination here it has to show you 120 minutes. OK, so information uh, with respect to the examination that has to appear on this page and going ahead to the next page. Again, I repeat examination has not yet started. More information. Exam formats, timings, unscheduled breaks, what you can do, whether you can take unscheduled breaks. Yes, in case if you want to take unscheduled breaks, you know what you have to do is. Exam clock will continue running and you will not be able to return to any question that you saw prior to the break. OK, so that is very important uh, point to note. Although we have allocated five minutes for break time. They are considering five minutes as a break time in total or, or total duration. OK, so very important information that you will see here. Okay, quickly go through it. Okay, that will give you more information regarding uh, do's and don'ts okay, for the examination. And here now it, is, it will ask you. Uh, it will show you 120 minutes. Here it will show you total number of questions, which may be around 45. OK, and then now we can ask. We can ask it to start the examination. So when we ask it to start the examination, it will start the clock. So now here, you know, uh, countdown clock has been started. OK, so I'm going to the next page. So now on the next page, it has to show me actual questions. This question has been divided into two parts. In the first part, there is a question statement and in the second part, there are all options given. You have to read the question statement. OK, now this is a small question statement. That's why there is no scroll bar appearing here. Otherwise, you, know, you will have to watch to that scroll, scroll bar okay, to ensure that uh, you have gone through the whole problem statement properly. So you can read this uh, uh, question. That is one thing. And you can then find the answer. Let us have a look at other components on the page. Do you want to review this question later? So in case if you are not very much confident about the answer that you are given and you would like to you know, uh, read the problem statement again, so you can mark that question for review. OK, after you submit all the questions, if there are some questions you want to submit a feedback for, like whether that question statement is confusing, so whatever be the feedback if you want to give, you know, so here also you can check. But remember, it will allow you to submit a feedback after submission of your exam. OK, so this feedback submission will not be part of the duration of the examination. OK, here it will keep showing you countdown. How much time is still remaining? OK, how many questions are remaining? So that that again you will have to keep monitoring. No, there are some of the questions are based on some mathematical calculations. So you are not allowed to carry even your calculator. You know, your mobile should be uh, uh, at the arm's distance. And while you are going for the examination, again, you are not allowed to uh, you know, refer to your uh, mobile also. OK, so they are giving you calculator here. If you want to take a break, OK, here is the way, but again, what they are suggesting you that if you want to take a break, you cannot come back to the question. You know, and you cannot change the answers of all the previous questions. OK, so or all the questions, those you are, you already have attempted. You know, so there you have to take the break, break here. Here I will read the problem statement and accordingly I will answer it. OK, this is a, a place uh, where I need to click to go to the next or previous uh, questions. So from here I can navigate to the questions. Uh, there are several uh, variations in this question. You respond to the question by selecting radio or option button. Now in this question, there is a radio button, so only one choice. What is your favorite sound? So I may be uh, you know, uh, selecting for reverb. Reverb sound maybe you know favorite. 
No, see, these are uh, this, this is one template they have designed. Okay, in uh, DP two zero three, you know they are not going to ask these questions anyway. They will ask the question related to curriculum of DP two zero three. But these are simply specific questions to give you idea how that screen will look like and uh, how questions will be shown. Going to the next question. So here you can see second question out of uh, 10 question in examination. You will see second question, maybe out of 40 question. Which two fruits make a great snack? Now here you can see. Scroll bar. OK, so which two fruits make a great snack? So I may select for apple. OK, and uh, melon. So for me, these two fruits may uh, make a great snack for me. Okay, going ahead. So now this is the third question. Now in this question, you will. Uh, so earlier question again, you know, note uh, one important uh, information about earlier question. It is multi choice question. So there are no radio buttons, but there are check boxes. Sorry. Going to the next question and in the next question, we have to you know, attempt matching the pairs. OK, so here there are options available. OK, and then you will have to read the uh, statement. OK, and uh, appropriate answer you have to drop here. So here it is asking me. Now here again, see a scroll bar. So this scroll bar, you have to be watchful you know, to ensure that you have re read complete question. It should not be uh, the case that only part of the question you read and you thought that that is the only, that is the question. No, OK, you have to read the complete question. So you shall you have to be watchful at a scroll bar. Which of the following piece of furniture uh, should you keep in the office or home? So lamp. Lamp normally goes in the uh, home because the office may not work in the night. Sofa. OK, normally sofa also goes. Uh, at the home. OK, it may not be in all offices. Table. Table will go into the office. Bookshelf may go into the home. So what will be the you know, answers, correct answers you find? For, for this question, you may argue that, you know, bookshelf or sofa may be in the office as well as at the home. OK, but here I am considering when a typical example of a small sized office. Because they are not mentioning whether the office is large or OK. Ping pong table. Ping pong table may also go into the uh, home. Chess set may also go to the home. Yes. So thereby. Desk chair that will go into the office. So that way you will have to drag and drop answers. OK, and uh, match the pairs. That type of question also is there. It is again a kind of multi choice question having you know, good weightage. So you cannot uh, avoid you know, missing such questions. Going to the next question. Now, this is the fourth question. No, this is the most difficult type of questions, I will say, in the sense that not only you are answering the questions, but you have to order your answers. OK, so you will get a weightage not only on answering, but also on the ordering. And in case if you do not mention the order correctly, you know, even if your answers are correct, you know, you may uh, lose the score because order completes the answer. That's why. So maybe uh, in uh, 203, a, a question may be asked uh, to you in order to create the external table. What are all steps followed and in what order? So, not only selecting the steps to follow, you have to arrange them in a specific order. That is very important. Here, the question may be you know, how do you create, uh, say, how do you cook a hand sandwich? Ham sandwich? Okay, so I don't know how do, uh, how do I create it. Yeah, I have never tried, so I am just selecting some arbitrary answers. OK, so. So first of all, we may be putting ham on the top. Yes. Ham on the top of the slicer, the, oh, then we may be adding a pickle there. We may be adding a moyo there. Okay. We may be adding ketchup there. 
we may be adding onion there. Acha. Okay, change the slice of the bread. That should be the first uh, uh, step, I think. Place the slice of the bread on the plate and place ham on the top of the side slice of bread. I think uh, this particular option I should take back here. Okay, place the slice of the bread on the top of the ham. That let me mention here. Okay, and after all that, then we will add these things. If you want to change the order, you can change it. For example, if you want to add mayo uh, before the pickle, you know, I can take it up this way. So I can change the order also. Okay, so that is the way you will answer this question. I'm going to the next one. So I will uh, request you to go through this uh, uh, sandbox, you know, to know uh, the types of the questions and to know more about the uh, examination environment. Okay, this is one image they are giving, and in that image they are giving some drop boxes also. I may be selecting one of the drop boxes there. Okay, so, so again, you will have to read this statement that accordingly you will have to give the correct answer there. Okay, so that is again a kind of a multi-choice question where they are showing you one image and in the image they are showing you drop boxes or check boxes. Okay, here uh, there is a combo box. Okay, you read the question carefully, then only you will be in a position to answer it correctly. I repeat again, read the question carefully. I am not reading it. Okay, so uh, if I am not reading it and still answering it, you know, I know uh, fate of this examination for me. Okay, so going to the next. This is sixth question. Okay, I'm now uh, fast forwarding because uh, anyway, uh, expecting you to you know go through uh, these questions. Okay, now this is case study based question. Okay, here you will see. Overview of the problem statement here you will see. Uh, you know, these are the heads and more information. The whole problem statement has been divided into different heads and subheads. OK, so accordingly you will refer to this case study. Here are the requirements. OK, and then. It will ask you for the question. Problem statement is also shown. Uh, existing environment. Let me close it. OK, so this is the first question. OK, from here you can see the problem statement and then I'm coming back to the first question. OK, read the question. Minute. Okay, it has to show me. That is the problem statement. Uh, now it is showing me problem statement. OK, and here then I will have to select the appropriate answer. So maybe I'm selecting one uh, uh, arbitrary answer. OK, you will select it carefully, clicking on the next. But this problem statement anyway, in order to answer uh, to this problem statement, you may have to refer to uh, uh, information about the case study. OK, so multiple such questions will be asked. Now I am on the ninth question. Here again, you they may be giving you some exhibit. You will have to refer to the exhibit and accordingly, then you will have to answer the question. OK, so here I am selecting one uh, random question, a random answer. OK, but there will be some exhibits given and then you will have to select the question. Now it is the last question perhaps. OK, and again, in this question, here is the problem statement. You can refer to different exhibits available here. OK, and then accordingly, you will answer the question. So again, here I am randomly, arbitrarily answering the question. OK, and finally, I am clicking on the next. Now, this is being a last question. This may be leading to the final submission. And here it is giving me how much I have completed. How many questions I have selected for review? OK, whether I can uh, click on the review and I can. I want to revisit that question 
whether I want to do that, that also I can do from here. So I can revisit the questions one by one. And when I click on finish, it will just uh, take a confirmation from me whether I want to do a final submission or not. OK, and then if I want to. Uh, there may be a pause after you click yes. OK, I want to. I want to be sure about it. So I'm clicking on the yes. And finally, you know, uh, this is the final submission. Now, if I want to. Uh, uh, give the feedback to the question from here. I can give now. OK, and if I do not want to give the feedback, I can exit from here. If I exit, so thereby I, I uh, am doing the final submission of the examination. OK, and then I am expecting uh, the result. Now, as I did not read the question, the problem statements uh, uh, properly, so this is the fate I am, uh, I am expecting that I will not pass the examination. OK, and my score is not one, two, three. It is a zero. <laughs> OK, so fine. So I believe you will uh, carefully appear for the examination. And then finally, I'm clicking on the picture. And here it will show me the feedback. OK, statistics. And thereby it will show me. Uh, on the different module wise statistics, it will show me. As I have scored a zero, there is a, you know, uh, no statistics it has to show, but otherwise module wise uh, statistics it will show. And thereby, you know, it is the time for us to end the examination. OK, so before you go for the examination, everybody is recommended to. Do this exercise. OK, coming back to our page. Now on this page, see. Huh, one more thing I would like to show to you on the study guide. On the study guide. You know, here is a recent most updated curriculum available. The design and implement data storage. Develop data processing, so this is most recent updated. Curriculum available. And that you can you know refer to to know what are all points you need to uh, work upon. There is a list of the study resources available here. So here you can find the different documentations also. And you know, the, uh, so this, these references are important with respect to examination. So these references are also a place you can uh, visit and uh, study. About. Yeah. So again, coming back to Take a free practice assessment. So here you will get around 50 questions. You know, and they those 50 questions you can uh, you know, answer to know your level of preparation. OK, so these 50 questions will not come in examination. That is for sure. But the level of the complexities you can uh, uh, understand the level of the complexities of the questions that will come in the examination. So you can click here. OK, I will take you to some of the uh, specific questions by end of the session. OK, but from here you can. Um, uh, ensure your level of preparation. OK, coming back to this page. One more thing I would like to bring to your notice. Here also you can see uh, pre uh, practice assessment. So those 50 questions can be seen from here also. Videos. Now here if you click. OK, there are preparation videos available. So those also, you know, a way to uh, you know, prepare yourself. Those videos also, you know, take you to through uh, different concepts. OK, and. Those videos are, you know, uh, this video is on segment first. Okay, this video is on segment first. OK, then uh, there are you know, videos on two other segments. So here is a uh, video available. Here is a video available. So it is recommended that you to 
uh, you know, listen to these videos also. These videos are not too long uh, to refer to. You know, maybe uh, of the time of uh, 20 uh, minutes to 30 minutes. Okay. But those videos will take you to the tour of you know, different concepts. Okay. Important concepts. So those videos also, you know, I can recommend to you to go through those videos also. Okay. Coming back to online study material available. So here is that online study material. So when I am clicking over here, the complete study material, okay, has been available here. And this study material, you know, not only uh, help you to, uh, to cover the fundamentals of the topic, you know, they are covering the topics uh, in sufficient depth also. Covering the topics in sufficient depth also. Okay, so those study materials are really important. So here you can see there is one more benefit. Okay, although for this benefit, you will not uh, refer to the material that whenever you read the material, you know, in your profile, it will keep adding the points. So thereby, you know, those points uh, become the part of your profile. Okay, and thereby whoever will refer to your profile that that somebody will also can uh, you know, understand how much uh, reading you have done on the topic. Okay, so here you can refer to uh, different points. Okay, and I will be taking you uh, through uh, some of the important points in today's discussion. But these web pages are very nicely written. You know, the study material is really very nice. Okay, and I will suggest, suggest you not to miss this opportunity to refer to this study material. Okay, so from here also, you can refer to the study material. Okay, let me just uh, visit uh, whether I have received any question. Anybody has any question on going for the examination? You know, please uh, put the question in your chat so that I can answer them before I go for the next topic. Yes, exam prep. Okay, so it is for exam prep. How uh, you will prepare yourself for the examination? Okay, where is the study material available? Where are the links available? Uh, you know, which will help you to get uh, yourself uh, ready for the examination. Okay, in addition to that, I will take you through the tour. I will take you through the tour also, uh, tour of the curriculum. Now, this uh, PPT is not shareable. Uh, I think of all the important uh, URLs. I already have shared with you, and that is what I have mentioned in the PPT. Okay, uh, one thing you please note: you know, PPT will have the points which may not be valid tomorrow. Like uh, you know, in front of you, I deleted a couple of points there. Those are not valid today. So I have taken you to the very authentic documentation. You know, from where you will get correct uh, information all the time. Uh, for us, uh, ah, yes, yes. Exam prep session. DP. Yes, is any certificate provided after completion of the session that I am leaving to uh, Chetali to answer? Chetali, uh, please uh, answer that question. So uh, that's all about the examination. Okay, now let me take you through uh, introduction to the subject. Okay, and uh, would like to know how many uh, joinees are there. So there are around 51 joinees, 52 joinees. I would like to know, you know uh, who are attending this session uh, for the purpose of uh, Final touches to the preparation. Sometimes what happens, you 
you already have done a preparation of the certification, but before you go for the certification, you want to attend one session. So how many of you are attending this session and ready with a final preparation? You can raise your hands. OK, so it seems that nobody of us uh, have done a preparation. OK, so now let let me put another question. Whether there are some of you who have done half of the preparation. And. Uh, remaining half of the preparation uh, still pending and thereafter you are planning to go for the examination. So how many of us have done you know, partial preparation? for this certification. OK, one of us has done a partial preparation. You please keep your hands raised so that I will come to know how many of you. Please raise your hands and keep them raised. Huh? OK, OK, I can see two of us have done partial preparation. Three of us. Four of us. Five of us. OK, so it seems five of us have done partial preparation. OK, and remaining so remaining maybe around uh, 46 of us have done partial preparation. remaining maybe uh, 45 to 40, 46. You know, who are looking to begin and who are looking for beginning the preparation for this certification. So here, uh, you know what I will do? I will cover some of the basic concepts you know, before I go uh, for uh, let's say, uh, important concepts. So some of the basic concepts let me cover to begin with. OK, here in the chat. We are sharing learning achievement badge. You have to activate it. Huh? Read. Uh, Chaitali has shared one message to you. Read that message. OK, and you can lower your hands. OK, so now let me take you to the uh, slides one by one. OK, again, these slides are you know, Microsoft slides. You know, these we cannot share because these are under copyrights. These are a couple of points I'm planning to cover subject to availability of the time. Uh, it is very difficult to cover all 11 points in a, in a day. OK, but uh, let us see how many points we can cover. And again, I repeat you know, by end of the day, I will be uh, uh, you know, covering these points until 430 and post 430. You know, then we will visit a couple of specimen questions. OK, and thereafter, then we will go into huddle you know, of discussing uh, the question answer session. Introduction to data engineering on Azure. Before I come here, I would like to draw one diagram for you and explain you some of the challenges you know, before we go ahead. OK, so let me just uh, Paint. Now, in data processing, what is happening uh, as on today? You know, till yesterday, there was very limited kind of data sources from where we used to you know, get the data, like maybe database. So here is the database, relational database system. Here is the database. RDBX. Okay, there may be flat file system. You know, although we hardly might have used a flat file system for storing the data and reading it, but still let me mention that there may be flat file system you know, we will be using early, in early days. Okay, so this is flat files. And from there, then we used to read the data we may be accumulating the data at one place okay and we may be then doing uh, 
data processing. So bringing the data from these data sources was not a challenge much or severe challenge earlier for the reason that there were very few and very limited type of data sources earlier. But now what is happening is there are many, many data sources. You know, you can receive the data from relational database system. You can receive the data from flat file system. You can receive the data from uh, the data warehousing system. You can receive the data from IoT devices. You can receive data from logs. You can receive data from logs. You can receive data from other applications. So systems have become much complicated as on today. Specifically when you know, time comes to uh, bring the data from variety of the data sources. So the first challenge what today's industry is facing is. OK, how can we ingest the data from the different and variety of the data sources? Data ingestion is the first challenge. Data ingestion. Earlier this was not a challenge because there were very few data types of data sources earlier, but today, you know, it is it has become a challenge. So you have to have your system you know, capable of connecting to so many data sources, and you know, every data source has to have its own uh, driver. Every data source has to have its own uh, authentication. Okay, so you have to have one system capable of you know, using. Uh, data source specific drivers and uh, using appropriate secured authentication arrangements. OK, so this data ingestion system, you know, you have to have uh, uh, very effective today, simple and effective today. Once you collect the data on that data, then you may be applying the data processing. So here you may be applying the data process. What do you mean by data processing? Remember, whenever you are receiving the data, it is not always with an adequate quality. So in data processing, first of all, you have to focus on increasing the quality of the data. There may be some of the missing values in the data. There may be some of the values which are distorted. There may be some of the values which are, you know, uh, wrong in the sense that, you know, uh, those values are invalid. So there may be some invalid values there. There may be some values which are unusual. OK, so there may be, you know, uh, different types of values and you have to merge this data to increase its quality. So data cleaning is very important step in the data box. Cleaning. OK, then comes data transformation. So you may have to change the data type, so you might have received some column value, a numeric column value as a text. Now you want to convert it into a numeric value. So there may be you know, full name you have received as a text, but from that full name, you have to split that name in first name, middle name, and a last name like. You may have to apply some data transform. Data. So, these the steps you will have to apply while uh, you know doing the data processing, and basically the purpose of this step is to increase the quality of the data. First of all, to understand you know uh, how much is the quality of the existing data, and then you will have to increase the quality of the data. Okay, so that is a type of data process. Then we have to do something called as a data aggregation. So in data aggregation. Here you will apply. You, know, you will group the data. You will calculate average of some of the columns. You will calculate summation of some of the columns. So you will apply something called as the data aggregation. Here I will mention about data aggregation. Aggregation, grouping. OK, summarizing. Multiple such steps do come here. And once you get the data properly aggregated, now you can use that data to draw different reports, to create different reports, to create different visuals, 
to submit the data to maybe another application. So now on this data can be apply different operations. So here you may be drawing, creating some reports here. You may be drawing some visuals, maybe submitting that data uh, to another application. Uh, you may be preserving that data for the future use. OK, so that's the uh, you know, you will be uh, doing these operations on the aggregated data. This process, you know, which will submit that data to other storages or drawing the visuals for creating the reports that is called as a. Uh, data string. Or ejection data ejection. Here it is data ejection. So these are the steps to be followed. Now here, you know, every step has its own set of challenges. Every step has its own set of challenges. OK, and there are multiple tools available here. There are multiple tools available. Here. OK, so in addition to the challenges, now let me mention here a couple of more challenges. OK, like. You will have to deal with a variety of the tools. So a tool to ingest the data, a tool to process the data, and then you will have to you know, do context switching across this. OK, so you will ingest the data, you will move it to one uh, storage reservoir. This data processing uh, step will pull the data from the storage reservoir and will apply different data processing over there. OK, and process the data again will uh, store into some uh, storage reservoir, which um, from where you know, this step will pull the data and will apply aggregation over the data. So there will be different and different tools for this. So variety of the tools. Variety of the tools, OK, will certainly lead to. Will. Or leads to. Lead to. The context of switching and having. Uh, uh, working. Uh, with the multiple services. Okay. Context switching across the. Context switching. Across the services. Across services. OK, and having the. Uh, uh, the different services uh, uh, and having. Uh, different skill sets. Different. Skill sets. So you should be good in doing you know, working with every uh, service. OK, so that is one challenge. What the solution we can offer here that we can have one platform on which all these services are available. So solution on this is unified. Platform. Capable of, you know, making all the things possible at one place. Only. Right. That is the first challenge. Second challenge is. Orchestration. Now here you will manually follow the, the steps. But in case if you want to automate all these steps, then you will have to automization of orchestrations. You will have to do automization of orchestration. So that is also a challenge. And again, that challenge can be again addressed with the unified platform. We, we will have a man, an orchestration like arrangement here okay, as a part of the Unified, a unified platform. So multiple such challenges are there. OK, and now let me come back to the slides. OK, and here I have you know created a background of why do we need unified platform for doing all these steps? There are many steps. Every step has its own complexities. OK, every step has its own set of tools. But in case if I get these tools at one place, you know, one stop shopping at one place, you know, that will be always a great purpose. Again, now let us come to a few more complexities, like whenever you are representing the data, what are the different types of data? The structured data, semi-structured data, unstructured data. So structured data means a data for which you know schema is a fix. OK, so let me mention here about Structured. 
secured it in. Schema is fixed. Okay, RDBMS like storages represent structured data. Okay, because they are based on schema. Whenever you create a table, you declare a schema. Schema is fixed. Schema is fixed. Semi structured data. Semi structured data. Here, schema is there, but it may not be fixed. Okay, so there may be a variation um, uh, in the schema. So for every record, schema may be a little bit different. For example, you know, first record has only one mobile number. So there will be only one column to record the mobile number, but second record has two mobile numbers. So there will be two columns the rest of the columns will be same, but for representing uh, second mobile number, there will be additional. Column. The third uh, record may have three mobile numbers. Fourth record will have no mobile number at all. So for fourth record, there will not be a column to record a mobile. So there is a you know, variation in the scheme. Okay, so that's why we call it as a semi structure. Variation record specific variation in scheme. Okay, in order to represent such a data, now such a data cannot be represented in table structure. Once you create one table uh, to uh, store one mobile number, you know, then in case if you want to store there two mobile number, you have to you know, uh, submit a DDL statement there, and uh, that column gets added for all the records. You know, that column will not be uh, for uh, second record only. It will be for all the records. For other records, it may go blank. That column may go blank. So there will be a uh, vestige of space also. So whenever you will see variation in the schema, you know, uh, semi-structured uh, data representations are frequent. Because they get they upload data in less space. Record specific variation in schema. There are multiple uh, representations here. Uh, so there may be representation like JSON. JSON is a representation. XML also can be a representation. Okay, in structure data, I will see a representation something like CSV. CSV. I will see Parkway. They yeah, are representing structured data. Okay, unstructured, unstructured data. Unstructured data means which does not have a schema. Okay, so images, audios, videos, images, audios, videos. They are unstructured data. And as on today, you know, you are getting the data in all these three types. Yesterday's system will not work today, where yesterday's systems were designed to refer to RDBMS only. But today, you have to have a system capable of referring to all these types of data. Okay, so different data sources. The data sources are different. Data formats are different. Different. Data sources and formats. That is a very severe challenge I want today for today's system. Okay. Different data operations. Integration means bringing the data. Then we will transform the data. Then we will aggregate or consolidate the data. Okay. So different data operations. So for doing a different data operations, here also we have a different types of uh, data operating systems, data operations. So here, query engines are there, you know, which will be you know modifying the data the way we want. Query engines are there. Okay, 
then there are uh, say data warehouses data warehouses these were houses data warehouses query engines are for small and medium uh, data sizes and uh, simple and medium complex queries okay for small and medium data sizes and complex engines data warehouses are for medium and large data sizes for medium and large data sizes and complex engines okay. then comes big data processing system big data processing Big data processing systems means you are receiving the very large data. That data size is so large, perhaps even relational database management systems are not capable of storing them, are not enough for storing them. So your data may be running in petabytes. Okay, and you want to process that data. So you such a data you cannot hold in you know, uh, relational database management systems. Then you have to have you know, uh, data lake like arrangements, data lake storages are humongous storages where you know, data of any size can go. Okay. And then you have to have a system, you know, efficient enough to process that data in as least time as it can. Okay. So Hadoop like Hadoop distributed processing systems, processing systems. Can be examples here, and just to add a few more examples here, you know, I can mention. Means now, let me talk about the uh, Synapse terminology. So in Synapse, you were, here you will have uh, um, something called as a Spark, Spark pool, Spark pool. Spark. Okay, there is a data bricks also. Data bricks capable of doing same thing. HD Insight is there. Insight. All these are GST. All these are Azure services available, capable of doing big data processing. For data warehousing, here we have, if we talk about uh, Synapse services, Synapse services. So here you will have a dedicated SQL tool. Dedicated SQL. For query engines on Azure, here you will have uh, Azure SQL data, Azure SQL services. Okay, so here you will see databases, databases. Here you will see managed databases, VM based databases, VM based DBs. Okay. In addition to this, you know there will be okay. Uh, yes, so uh, there will be no SQL databases also. Let me mention that thing here. No SQL databases also. No SQL databases where data is represented in the form of the JSON or in the form of the document. So MongoDB is there. Mongo DB is there on Azure. We have document DB, document DB. Okay, and uh, then here we will have Mongo DB, document DB, uh, Cosmos DB is also there. Cosmos DB on Azure. Okay, so multiple such services are available. You know, this is now very important point what I am mentioning. So. Yes. OK. So here you will do transformation of the data. Data processing means data transformation. And then in order to visualize the data, in order to create the reports of the data, then we have visualization. Visualization tools okay, on uh, Microsoft platform with the Power BI. OK, then visualization is also possible in as Azure data breaks. Data breaks also. Uh, of course, including a dashboards and Azure data bricks. 
Kitten, you have tab new and many other tools to do visualization and a report generation. OK, so this is one you know, end to end view of the services that are, are available uh, in the market as well as on the Azure. OK, and here what we will do, you know, here you will see Synapse. Now let us understand more about the Synapse. But before I go to the Synapse, again, let me come back to uh, this slide you know, to refer to other challenges. So language is one more challenge. You are coming, you are a developer coming from one language background and the services may not be supporting uh, that language platform. OK, so then you will have to read uh, and uh, say learn another language. So as on today, you know, these uh, services are offering you multilingual support also. It means if you are from not from development background, still you, you, you will be able to do the development by using SQL. SQL is a programming. If you are from uh, the background of development in scripting language, you know, there you can learn Python quickly and you can do development in Python. Scala, R language, Java, .NET, many such languages are being supported by a single platform. By a single platform. That is the point I want to make. Okay, so irrespective of your background, you can do a development here. That is also possible. Data engineering works with multiple types of data to perform a variety of data operations using a range of tools and scripting languages. So data engineer should be able to understand anatomy of the data, should be able to understand from where the data engineer can get the uh, data, should be able to apply different operations on the data, and should be able to do the development using uh, languages and thereafter, you know, should be able to present the data for the purpose of the validation. Be able to present the data for the native language. Yeah, uh, this is again one more slide on which I will focus a little bit more, and thereafter, then we will do some fast forward also. This is also covering. Uh, complete ecosystem of uh, big data analytics and data warehousing. Operational and, and analytical data. Now this is very important point. Operational means transactional data. Analytical means optimized data optimized for analytics purpose. Now let me quickly explain here. Uh, transactional data and data for analytics. Transactional data. Whenever any transaction happens, like sales transaction, a new record is created and that record is uh, added into or inserted into database. Here, uh, for every uh, cell, a new record gets inserted. So, for every event, for every happening, new record is getting created and that record is being added into the database. So transaction management is very important feature. Transaction management. Whenever you talk about transaction management, you have to you know, start the transaction. Then you may be doing uh, some atomic steps there. OK, and then you have to uh, commit the transaction or roll back the transaction. So atomic operations is very important. Okay. Atomic. Operations are very important here. Atomic operations are very important here, and this kind of you know workload is called as a OLTP work, online transactional workload, OL processing, processing, OLTP, OLTP work. Okay, all all RDBMS means all databases are you know meant for transactional data. Databases. They are meant for transactional data. Then comes analytical data. Analytical data. Okay. There we don't do transaction management. First of all, you accumulate transactional data 
and then you submit that data for the purpose of the analytics. So for analytical data also, the first step is actually the transaction. But in analytical data, what you do, there may be many columns in the data. On two, three columns, you want to do some analytics. So you will read only do those two, three columns. And on that, on those two, three columns, you will apply some analytics. So in analytical data, you don't need a data row by row. You need a data column by column. Column by column. Here, this analytical data or that approach completely differs with the transactional data. Because in transactional data, it works row by row. And analytical data works column by column. So here, you know, in case if your data is not stored row by row, but if it is stored column by column, then analytical processing works very fast. So column major data representation. Data when represented as a column major. Okay, there this analytical processing gives you very good performance. Okay, so one data cannot be represented row by row as well as column by column at the same time. Either it is row by row or column by row. So here then for this purpose, you have to have transformations to be done. Okay, transform data from row by row to column by column. This transformation, you know, makes your data suitable for analytical purpose. And in analytical purpose, always these analytical operations are complex. They are already, you know, taking a longer time. So in case if it gets data column by column, the performance of analytical operations increases. OK, so here I am trying to bring to your notice a major difference between them. OK, this kind of operation is called as the online analytical processing means uh, OLAP workload, online analytical processing means OLAP workload. Okay, workload. Normally, all analytical systems, you know, uh, uh, so represent the data in this way, column major, column major. Okay, so um, mostly data warehouses. Okay, data warehouses, data warehouses will represent data this way. Okay, then uh, um, uh, you know, in memory, whenever you want to uh, represent the data, you know, here you use a in-memory table structure to represent the data. In-memory table structure. In-memory. In-memory table structure. Table structure. In order to represent the data for this, okay, in-memory, in-memory uh, representation. In-memory representation. Okay, so you have to have you know, uh, in memory storage, uh, which is representing color data in the column major format. Okay, so who can do that? So there then you will see uh, pandas data frame. In Python, there is a pandas data frame. So not pandas only. Let me mention here uh, word data frame. Data frame. Data frames are available in Python, in pandas. They are available in Spark. They are available in R. And what is common among all these data frames that all these data frames represent data in column major form. They represent data in column major form. OK, and I already told you for analytical data, the first step is uh, to capture data uh, using uh, trans OLTP workload. Then in order to get that data for analytical processing, you have to apply the transformation. And that transformation will convert your row by row data to column by column. So this transformation is also a very important step. And here let me mention specifically those who already have you know worked on it that this transformation, who will do this transformation? You know, that will be decided 
uh, and that is the main uh, reason for coming up with a concept of something called as a H tap hybrid H tap hybrid transactional and analytical processing hybrid transactional and analytical processing. So this transformation is needed, but who will do that? That is taken care here in HTAP, and you know that is one more uh, feature synapsis supporting. That's why I just elaborated why it is important. Okay, streaming data. That is again one more way of uh, processing. So there are again two ways of processing the data. OK, here let me mention them. Uh, one is part of the back processing. And another is called as the stream process. So in back processing, what do you do? You get very large data set. Very large data set. OK, and then you process it in the distributed processing system. OK, so distributed. Processing system. One of the examples here is massive parallel processing system. Another example is Hadoop. Hadoop architecture. So Hadoop and massive parallel processing system, these architectures have been designed you know, to meet this requirement. The data is very large in size. Okay, and the uh, analysis, whenever we want to do on the data, that is to be done in very short span of time. There then we have to go for distributed processing system. OK, stream processing system is also there. In case of stream processing system, what happens is data size is small. Data size is small, OK, but response time is very fast. Response time is very fast. So here response time goes in millimeters, uh, sorry, milliseconds and seconds. Although here response time may go in hours and days. Here response time is milliseconds. Seconds. Let me give you some example. Now on the sales data of last year, you want to apply some processing. Now sales data of last year, you know, all the you know sales done by all the branches all over the India, you know that self data uh, bound to be very large in size. So in case if for some reason you want to process sales data, that will be bad process. But if you are receiving some data, maybe log data, server log data, and you want to do some analytics over there, okay, so that will be stream processing. So here what it does is, you know, logs are received in last two minutes will be processed immediately to identify the health of the system to analyze the health of the system so how many logs it will receive in la pre say last two minutes maybe 100 logs at the most 500 logs so data size is normally smaller here but you have to have again a distributed processing system here to give the responses in short span of it, or you need distributed processing systems. Distributed processing systems. Whenever you map it with a synapse system, and here in the synapse, you have something called as a serverless SQL pool, you have something called as a dedicated SQL pool. And you have something called as a spark. OK, hereby I'm taking an opportunity to bring different uh, the components of the synapse. So here you will have server days dedicated. What they do that we will see in for a detail. OK, I'm just trying to you know, uh, map that these tools you will use or the features of the synapse you will use for doing the back dedicated. OK, and spark. They can do that process. So actually here 
I should remove these names because they are not the processing systems. They are not processing systems. There will be engines, but they are basically data warehousing systems. OK, so there will be compute associated with, uh, with it as server is associated with it. That's why I'm leaving them there. OK, but basically uh, most uh, highly performing and most suitable tool here is the Spark. Spark can do Spark processing. Stream processing. Now Spark can do stream processing also. Spark can do stream processing because Spark is distributed. So it can do stream processing also. So here you will see Spark is appearing at both the places. What are all other tools where you will see the Spark? Spark has become so important tool today as it offers batch and stream processing. You know, and it can processing within a very short span of time. So Spark has become so important tool in big data processing, you know, that there are multiple services, you know, where Spark works at the heart as the main processing engine. So Azure Databricks also has a Spark. Azure Databricks also has a Spark. Then there is something called as a HD Insight. HD Insight. That also has a Spark running at the top of Hadoop. So Hadoop plus Spark is very important uh, uh, engine here. OK, so that's uh, about you know, different uh, types of processings. Then uh, I already have drew this diagram from where we are bringing the data from variety of the data sources, and then we want to automate this uh, processing. You know that processing may trigger its execution automatically every evening. OK, we'll bring data from variety of the data sources. We'll apply different data processing over there and you know, we'll do aggregation. So this A to end pipeline, it will run automatically you know, at the scheduled time and will keep your data ready. OK, so in order to do this automation and orchestration, then we have you know, on Azure, we have something called as Azure Data Factory. Azure Data Factory. This orchestration is also possible in data bricks. Data bricks, OK, plus Spark. There also you can do this orchestration, automation. You know, so uh, multiple tools are available there for doing the, the same thing. And whenever we are talking about unification of all the services, you know, there then we can see all these services, even uh, this automation also, you know, is available in a synapse, something called as a synapse pipeline. Right. So here I have used synapse serverless, synapse dedicated, synapse park, and all these are the features available in synapse. So serverless, synapse dedicated, synapse park. Now, all these are the things that they have brought together, and Synapse has been designed you know, uh, in such a way that uh, you know uh, you will get one stop solution for doing end to end data processing. End to end data processing. Okay, so, there is a the significance of the Synapse. In order to store very large data, we have something called as a data lake. Data lake okay, offers you multiple benefits now storages in storages we have something called as a data leak data humongous storage humongous storage means you know literally they are saying this is unlimited storage so whatever with the data size you know, there is no upper limit for uh, data leaks to store that data. OK. So not only it is offering you humongous storage, it also offers you uh, better read and write speed. Better read write speed. 
okay because it is distributed because of its distributed feature so it has a distributed storage and that's why it is it offers you uh, better read and write speed so data lake is one of the very important uh, storage uh, uh, service here specifically in data engineering and in, uh, in doing analytics data warehouse is also there so data warehouse here is a dedicated sql tool okay. so data warehouse is also there data warehouse i already have told you about the data warehouse okay. so data warehouse can here i have already mentioned it is basically for olap workload data warehouse here i have mentioned olap workload okay so that also is there <coughs> In the form of Synapse dedicated. Synapse dedicated. For a data lake, okay, there is a, something called as a Synapse server layer. Server layers. All these things are together at one place in Synapse. Okay. And Apache Spark is there. I already told you for uh, analytical processing, there is the Apache Spark. So for analytical processing, data. multiple things I explained to you uh, here. OK, uh, before I go ahead, let me just check whether we have any video on this. When to use batch versus stream processing? No batch processing. You know, in batch processing, data is very large, and that's why uh, you know data processing is uh, going to take a longer time. Okay, and there you do expect a response latency in hours and days. So there you do not expect your latency in seconds and minutes. Okay. I gave you example of uh, you know processing last year sales data to draw different visuals out of it. Okay, so that can be an example of a batch processing where your last year sales data may be running into petabytes. Okay, you will read say hundreds of columns of data, but not on all columns. But you will apply some analytical processing on selected columns to draw different and different uh, inferences. OK, so there may be a management meeting uh, by end of the month. OK, and analyst will have to create such visuals and create some reports for that meeting. So he may be getting a time of a week or so you know, to uh, prepare the data and to prepare different and different visuals. So here he will take a time of one day, two day, three days to prepare that data. That it has to he has to do using batch processing. Okay, now example of screen processing. That example I already gave to you. That in case if uh, you know data is getting accumulated in logs of the servers, and from the logs if we want to design an analytic system which will monitor the health of the server. Okay, so and in case if it realizes that that system if realizes that you know, at any point of time, you know, the server is running out of memory. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are chances that, uh, you know, server uh, health will deteriorate uh, because it is running out of the memory, because it is running short of the memory. OK, in that case, uh, it is necessary to take some of the measures. OK, and there, you know, this uh, health monitoring system, you know, must not be responding in hours and days. It has to respond maybe within minutes or second so that you know uh, the stakeholders should get enough uh, opportunity and enough time to take the uh, you know, alternative measures to improve the uh, health of the server. So these two examples I have given you. OK, in case if you have any other question, let me know. I am going to the another uh, question. Data lake doesn't need ETL. Uh, yes, absolutely right. 
you know etl normally is needed when you do not have sufficient storage space so what you do you extract the data you transform the data and the major reason for transforming the data is to you know reduce the data size so that wherever you want to load that data your device where you want to load that data you know uh, will be able to accommodate that data so whenever you have small storages there you have to go with a et where do you go with elt extract load and transform every data you load and whenever every data you load you know you have to have a loading system capable of you know storing large data data lake is for elt so first of all you load every data into storage device and then you decide now that you have got all the data which transformation you will apply after okay so data lakes are basically for elt but relational database management so sorry databases block storage is they are for etl you are absolutely right any other question or i think it is a time for us to take a uh, tea break okay then so let us take a tea break of uh, uh, how much uh, what do you suggest how much long a tea break should we take for the 10 minutes sufficient yes okay so i am consume uh, uh, assuming it is uh, as a 12 o'clock so we will resume our session by 12:10 okay tea break will resume session by well i will go on the mute in the meantime i will unshare my screen okay and i will uh, commence the session sharp by 10 uh, 12 12 to be there sharp by 12 12 so i am going on the mute now in the meantime if you have some questions keep putting them into the chat
Uh, hope all of you are back from uh, break. And uh, let us resume our switch now. <laughs> so I'm sharing my screen again. So let us understand uh, what exactly Synapse Analytics is. And uh, here in this diagram, you can see what are all different structures uh, uh, available in Synapse Analytics. So Synapse Analytics is a unified service where you can do end-to-end -end data processing. There is the arrangement to uh, store the data as a data warehouse. There are arrangements to ingest the data from the variety of the data sources. There are arrangements to process the data. There are arrangements to create, you know, sh um, uh, and schedule uh, data pipeline and orchestrate data pipeline. And there are arrangements, you know, to manage all these things through single port. So here in this diagram, you will see Synapse SQL represents bringing, uh, so representing data. You know, in the relational database format, or I mean to say in the structured format as well as semi-structured format. So this represents your data in all types of formats, structured and semi-structured. Okay, this represents uh, 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 creating and scheduling data orchestration. This represents each tap bringing data from variety of the data sources and transforming that data from transactional data format to analytical data format. Transactional data format to analytical data format. I already mentioned and uh, explained this thing that transactional data formats are row major and analytical data formats are column major. You know, so here you will get or Synapse Analytics gets uh, data uh, in the column major. Uh, and that data, you know, it uh, Synapse Analytics can directly operate upon for analytical purposes without doing any transaction. OK, and in order to do big data analytics, here is a Synapse Spark. So Synapse Spark allows you to do big data analytics. And in order to manage all these things, govern all these things, Monitor all these things from one place. We have something called the Synapse. An integrated and unified analytic platform which combines data warehousing, big data analytics, data integration, visualization, everything you can combine at one place. So it becomes a one stop solution for uh, you to design end to end data pipeline. It brings the best of uh, SQL technologies. Very enterprise data warehouse. So there is the enterprise data warehouse uh, solution available inside uh, Synapse Analytics. Spark technologies to do big data analytics and orchestrate all the activities and their data flows. Okay. Um, so it brings all the best of all these things. It provides an, uh, a data analytics environment, data engineering environment, and even data science environment also. For Different rules again, one stock solution. Top view of uh, Synapse Analytics. There is something called as a Synapse workspace, capable of uh, you know managing, governing all your business assets. Those are getting created, you know, whenever you do different you. Uh, define different business processes and you define different data processing. OK, so different business assets gets created and those uh, business assets are preserved under or within purpose. So here you remember whenever you create. Synapse already as a service. You know, that service creates a workspace for you. And that workspace, you know, it has a storage also. And that workspace view you can get through Synapse Studio. 
Synapse Studio. Okay, let me take you to uh, say portal. Okay, and here, here is the Azure portal. Here is the resource group. I have named it as the DP203. Okay, and in this resource group, here I have created a service. Okay, uh, how did I create this service? Okay, that let me show. But here is a service. Okay, and here is the storage. Remember here, storage. This is a managed storage which gets automatically and mandatorily created when I create a service. So this service is the in, uh, internally depending on the storage, and that's why whenever you create a service, you know the storage gets automatically created. How do you create this service? So I'm clicking on plus create. Okay, and here I can ask it of Synapse. Just a minute, huh? just a minute. Just a minute. Sorry. Coming back. So here I can search for Synapse Analytics. And here I can select Synapse Analytics. So I can search it in the marketplace. OK, if I go through all the services here, if I go through all the services, you know, Synapse Analytics also can be there inside. Is the analytics here here so there you can see it's data tech analytics analytics services here it is not showing me synapse analytics so is it inside a database let me just check At least it was under synapse. Okay, I will have to search here. Ideally, it should be within one of these uh, two, three things. Okay, I'm not uh, getting them right now. Okay, so it's not in databases. You compute. There is no reason why it is in compute. AI and machine learning. Okay, there also, I, I don't doubt whether it is. OK, we will have to search it here, but otherwise from here. OK. Uh, apps. Azure Synapse Analytics, I'm getting it here. OK, so I can search it. So somewhere it is there. OK, I, I think I did not have a careful look at analytics, but it should be there. OK, so from here also I can select it. And I want to create a new one. OK, so when I click on create, now here it will ask me in which uh, resource group should I create it. OK. Uh, manage resource group. So what happens is for supportive services, there are many supportive services. For supportive services, it creates a separate managed resource group. OK, and it gives uh, the name to that managed resource group in its way. OK, which may not be uh, you know, abiding by our naming conventions, our company's naming conventions. So in case if you want to name such manager resource group, OK, as per your naming convention, that name you can mention. Workspace name, region. I prefer going with the East US. OK, and then here you observe account name. So this is about data link storage gen. So here I have to give account name means I have to give workspace name. OK. Uh, no, no, sorry. Workspace name I already have given here. Here I will have to give name of the data lake storage. Name of the data lake storage. So 
either you can select the existing one or if you want to create a new one that is also possible but remember here this is the mandatory step that it needs a data lake to store its uh, workspace and all its business assets in the data lake store under which container should it uh, store all its system uh, business assets OK, so that container name can be given. OK, so what I did is. I created it. OK, uh, I submitted this information. OK, on the next tab, there is information related to security. This information I also have submitted. OK, this information basically is needed to connect to the data warehouse, you know, from. Uh, uh, from its uh, browser based uh, editor or from management studio running on the local machine. OK, so there you know, the credentials have to be given uh, here to connect to the data warehouse. Serverless SQL pool or dedicated SQL pool, whatever. It is. But yeah, those credentials are to be given. OK, so what I did is now I am not going to create on uh, click on review plus create. I already have created it for you because I know it takes a long time to get provisioned. OK, maybe 10, 15 minutes. I can save that time. So here I have created that uh, workspace. OK, uh, I am taking you to the uh, resource group inside which this workspace is created. OK, so I go to. Dashboard. Okay. So here is the workspace created and here is a data lake store. Created. I take you to the data lake store. To show to you that inside this data lake store, it has created one container. See this container. SYNS system. I did give a name of this container while provisioning Synapse Analytics. So data lake it has created and inside data lake it has created a data say container also. And inside this container it is going to store and it is going to preserve every business component that I will create. OK, uh, through uh, in the workspace. So every business component will come here. OK, there is another container appearing. This is uh, what I have created explicitly. OK, to show you running some of the labs. So inside this container, you know, I have created some folder structure. And inside this folder structure, you know, I have created. Uh, sorry, I have uploaded a data file. Here is a parkway data file I have uploaded and here is a folder structure. And this folder structure I have created to show to you. you know, how do I refer or how do I create a SQL query? To fetch the data from this parkway. And how in the SQL query we mention the location. Location of that file. OK. How we can do the partition also means uh, this kind of folder structure gets created wherever you are doing a partitioning of your data. OK, so such type of folder structures are extremely helpful whenever you have very large data size. OK, and uh, you want to enhance the performance of your system uh, uh, by partitioning your data, by partitioning your very large data. Such type of folder structures are extremely helpful that time. So that kind of you know folder structure I created and I uploaded the file. Coming back to uh, Synapse Analytics, okay. Uh, so uh, whenever you uh, click on the Synapse Analytics service, you know here whenever you are clicking on the Synapse Analytics service in your portal, it will take you to the overview page. On this overview page, just find here. The things which you can explicitly create. Dedicated SQL pool. And a Spark SQL. There is a new uh, uh, data explorer pool which is in preview. OK, I will not talk much about it. OK, these two are you know, SQL pools. Engines or services we have to explicitly create. But one more service you will see here, you know, which by default is existing, which we did not create. And that service is built in pool. We all call it as a server based SQL. 
serverless SQL. Initially, whenever you are creating it, this pool is in, uh, created, but its size is a zero. It means it does not consume any resource. And that's why it does not be logs. Even if it is created, and it does not be leave because its size is zero. So for what, which purpose they are giving it? So one thing you note, it is by default created, and there is no way to delete it. You cannot delete it. There is no option. There is no button available to delete it. Even if I click here, it is going not. It will delete not the SQL pool, but it will delete this service, this workspace. So I cannot, you know, use this button to delete the serverless SQL pool. So remember, serverless SQL pool gets automatically created, and it gets automatically deleted also, and it gets automatically scaled also. So whenever you want to run any query over there, then it needs a compute. So automatically it acquires a compute, runs your query and goes back. Its compute goes back to the uh, pool and thereby it stops building. So you are built only for the time, you know, it brings uh, the SQL engine, runs your query, Okay, so for the duration of running of the query, what your computer needs, you know, it will bill you for that compute only. So pay as you go, that kind of model it is. Okay, so that uh, so serverless SQL pool basically is for running ad hoc query. If you want to run a query and get a result and then you do not want to do anything. So for running ad hoc queries, serverless SQL pool is there. Whenever you run the query, it charges you. But whenever you don't run a query, it does not charge you at all. Whenever you run the query, and it decides whether one compute is enough for it or whether it needs a cluster of compute you know, for doing a parallel processing to create responses faster for your query. You know, there, you know, it will bring multiple, uh, uh, you know, servers from the uh, uh, serverless pool, you know, run your query and then sends all those uh, uh, serverless resources back to the pool. Okay, so that this is basically for running ad hoc queries. What is Dedicated SQL pool. So dedicated SQL represents data warehouse. It represents a data warehouse. And also remember that whenever you create a dedicated SQL pool, it starts charging you. If you have run 10 queries, you got the responses and still you know, your dedicated SQL pool is up and running. It will keep charging you even if it is idle. So dedicated SQL pool, billing scheme for a dedicated SQL pool is for the duration, you know, it is up and running. How do you decide the size of the dedicated SQL pool? I told you in case of serverless SQL pool, you know, it uh, decides depending on the complexity of the queries, it will decide how many uh, servers it has to uh, use to run that query to create the responses well within time. Okay, so auto scalable. This is auto scalable. How is the scalability of dedicated SQL? So dedicated SQL pool size, you know, is decided by something called as the uh, data DWU, Data Warehouse Unit. Data Warehouse Unit. Data Warehouse Unit. Okay, now size of the resources in case of database, database, they are counted by unit called as a DBU. DBU, database unit. 
database. It decides how much memory will be there, how much RAM will be there, how much input outputs writing reading speed will be there. So CPUs, RAM, and IO speed, IO performance speed. Same with the case here. More DBU if you allot, it will cost you more, but it will complete the processing in this time. So depending on your workload, you decide how many DBUs to allot to the database. On the same line, depending on your workload, you have to decide how many DWU you have to allot. Okay, so data warehouse unit. Data warehouse. Okay, and that data warehouse unit again is counted in the same. Counted in the same way. Okay, storage is something different. Uh, here, we do, in DWU or in DBU, we do not count as storage. So, storage is representing size of the data, but the DWU and DBU are representing uh, execution performance of the query. Execution performance of the query. Okay, and that's why only these three things are counted here in case of DBUs and DWs. There is something called as a RU in case of request units, in case of Azure Cosmos DB. Cosmos DB. There is something called as a DIU data integration units in case of Azure Data Factory. Azure data factory. So in Azure, you will see that these are different units, uh, uh, service specific units are used to, uh, 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 to decide the size of the uh, processing there, size of the compute there. Okay. Huh. So whenever you are creating a dedicated SQL tool, that time you have to give DWU. Uh, to it and accordingly it will create a size of the cluster and then you can run your queries. In order to do big data processing, here is a Spark tool. Here it can be used to do big data processing. Okay, now let us come to this hyperlink. Okay, here also there are a couple of URLs. This is a SQL endpoint for a dedicated SQL pool. This is a SQL endpoint. Or serverless SQL pool, these endpoints you can use uh, uh, to connect from uh, uh, SS, SS Management Studio, Server SQL Management Studio. Okay, and you can so SS, uh, my Management Studio may be running on your premise, but that also you can use to connect to these services. Okay, if you click over here, it will take you to this page. Uh, okay, this is a portal for. Uh, Synapse Analytics. It is a portal for Synapse Analytics. Okay, and here you will see some of the options. Okay, so here you will see data. You know, uh, linked services to connect to different data sources. You know, are de declared here. So when I click here, workspace and linked. Okay, so this is uh, you know primary data source which got created whenever we created this service, you know, so that is automatically appearing there, you know, and this this one is. Uh, increase its size. This is the name of the data lake store. This is the name of your workspace. OK, and from here also you can navigate to data lake store. You can navigate to data lake store through portal, but from here also you can navigate. OK, so this is a container. This is another container where I'm keeping some data. OK, so this particular tab represents, you know, in workspace here, it represents databases. Whenever we will create a database, those database names will appear here. So either uh, your data in the external uh, devices or your data in databases, you know, data after all, you know, that data can be managed to this tab. Development can be done from here. What type of development we can do here, just observe. So if you want to write queries, that is possible. If you want to uh, write a QL, 
doctor to do a screening. You know, that is possible. You know, if you want to write a spark code, by spark code through the notebook, that is also possible if you want to design jobs, if you want to design data flows, you know, multiple things are possible here. But this is for development. Data engineering. OK, so we will write some queries here also, and we will write some notebooks. Data integration. In order to design data pipeline. OK, uh, you can do that from here. So creating a data pipeline. Here you can create a data pipeline. OK, from here you can create a link connections. And, uh, so this data pipeline. OK, is similar to what you have seen in data factory. OK, so what they did is uh, similar kind of, you know, look and feel they are giving uh, here in uh, data pipeline. Same similar kind of look at. OK, then if you want to monitor different things like. Uh, uh, say working of uh, your queries, if you want to monitor that is also possible from here. You know, Spark pool, different uh, commands of Spark. If you want to monitor, there is something called as a Spark UI. You know that if you want to monitor, so those things you can see from here. Those things you can monitor from here. Also, you observe uh, if you want to trigger uh, query request, if you want to trigger a Spark application, that is also possible. The integration triggers. There is a concept of trigger in uh, data factory. Okay, so trigger is actually uh, an object, you know, which uh, is responsible to schedule. Uh, your data pipeline. OK, it is also responsible to trigger execution of your pipeline as per that schedule. Okay, so it triggers execution of the pipeline also. Okay, as per the schedule. So those things you can define from here. You can monitor from here. OK, and then let me come to manage section. OK, in manage section here, you know, you can manage all the things. From here also, if you want to create SQL pool, dedicated SQL pool. You can create it here from here. So remember, on the Azure portal, I did show you a place to create a pool. OK, and here in through the workspace also, I can create a pool and both these approaches are same. No difference at all. So when I try to click on plus new, now after all, it creates a dedicated SQL pool only. So this is uh, one approach to create a dedicated SQL pool, and from the portal also you can create a dedicated SQL pool. from portal also. On the same line, there is a, a way to create a Spark pool from portal, and there is a way to create Spark pool uh, from the workspace. So from here also you can create Spark. We will create a Spark pool and edit dedicated SQL pool, but a couple of things you can uh, say uh, observe here: security control. Credentials declaration, access control definitions can be given here. Different triggers can be declared here, can be defined here. Integration runtime also can be defined here. So in case if you are coming from data factory background, you know what do you mean by integration runtime? Okay, so integration runtime can be created here. Triggers can be created from here. Okay, different configurations can be given from here. So Spark configuration, data flow uh, configuration, Git configuration. For source control, if you want to uh, define a version control system, so that is also possible. If from here you can define Git configuration, and Git configuration will work as a version control system there. Okay, so version control system is possible here. Different governance are also possible here. Microsoft Purview. Microsoft Purview is basically a system, you know, which uh, manages compliances and. Uh, uh, data catalogs. OK, so from here, if you want to manage Microsoft Purview, that is also possible. You have to have its subscription and then from here you, know, you can connect to Microsoft Purview. OK, and every activity that you will do here thereafter, you know, will be in compliance with the rules declared in a Microsoft Purview. Okay, so it will not allow even Synapse service will not allow you to go beyond the uh, the rules declared in Microsoft Purview, so it has an you know, integration with the Microsoft Purview also. OK, so these are different different op options available. First of all, I will I would like to take you to. 
the primary storage. OK, this primary storage uh, got created when I created this service. OK, and here you see. Uh, this is a system uh, container what it created. Its name I have decided. No, no, sorry. This is a workspace name. Not a container name. This is a real name. This is a uh, container name and the primary word is suggesting me that this container is created and the uh, primary data source which got created mandatorily while creating the service. OK. Then here it is. Here I have created one container with the name www.i-02. Inside this container, there is another folder with the name still small. Inside that there is a folder year is equal to 2019. The folder name itself is year is equal to 2019. So actually, you know, I'm partitioning data year wise. I'm going inside it. Or I'm partitioning data with a cell category, cell small. Quarter is equal to zero. See how folder structure has been created here to appropriately segregate the data. Month is equal to 12. Day, so this is for today's cell, 2019-2019, December 31st. So month is December and that's why 12 is there. I go inside it and here is a parkway file. Here is the parkway. This parkway file I want to read or query. So how do I write that query? So I'm right clicking here on that parkway file and I can ask it to write a query to view first hundred rows. OK, so I'm clicking on this select top hundred rows. OK, and see what it does. So it is creating a new script file. OK, and inside this new script file, you know, it has it has given me I'm collapsing this property blade. Here it has written a code for me and you know uh, it has written that code automatically. Now let us have a look at this. Select top 100 from all the records. Open row set is a function available here. OK, we will try to understand more about this function as we will go ahead. You know, here. File format is being mentioned and here path to the file is being mentioned. So this is URL to the primary storage. This much is a URL to the primary storage. Inside this URL here, you will see name of the primary storage. And how do we realize that it is a primary storage? DFS URL. If it is not a primary storage, here you will see word blob, B-L-O-B. But if it is DFS, it means it is a primary storage. So here we are referring to the primary storage. Then path to the file. OK, and finally a file list. Let me put this code to run and let me see. How do I see the result? So inside this open row set function. We have given the destination. Uh, from where it has to bring the data and here we are mentioning the data format also. So I'm selecting this query and putting it to run. Now remember what it is going to do. It will run his query on built-in uh, serverless instance. Built-in serverless instance. Inside this built-in serverless instance, there is a default database already created. That is called as a master database. I did not create any database here. That query will be executed on the serverless SQL pool. That is the one point I would like to bring to your notice. And another point is. This parkway file is not queryable. What do you mean by parkway file? Parkway file stores the data in the binary form, but it stores the data in column major format. Stores the data in column major format. So this is one of the best, you know, col column major format data representations. Uh, 
for representing analytical data. What are all other data representations? Okay, which are column major. So Park B is one. Other is ORC. ORC also. ORC representation of the data is also column major. Okay. Uh, Parkway is uh, open source. Parkway is uh, open data format, and that's why uh, we are using it. And one of the most uh, high performing data format. Its performance is counted on two ways. One is how quickly it can give you the data, or how quickly it can uh, write the data. That is one thing. And the second thing is, and that is very important, how Big data it can accommodate it in less space. On both the fronts, this is the first thing. It encrypts the data in such a way that its encryption technique stores the data in less space compared to lesser space compared to all other data formats. Okay. And that's why Parkway is one of the most popular data formats as of today. I'm running this query. Here it is. And then it has to bring the data from that file. So it is running that query on the uh, serverless SQL pool. And here it has brought the data from the serverless SQL. It has brought the data from the serverless SQL. If on this data you want to draw some charts, that is also possible. OK, you can change the you know, column names here. And you can get some charts drawn. See what type of charts you can draw here: area, chart bar, column, line, pie, scatter. You know, multiple visual uh, visualizations available there. You know, and here, okay, it's uh, in the your script file only. You can see uh, the charts. Okay, so you got this query executed, and what is the significance of this query? Now, let me come to the important significance. Parkway is not variable, but here it is allowing me to write a select query on Parkway and I can bring the data. Now, this select query is also extremely powerful here. Okay, and we will try to give some of the you know, select queries here you know, to understand how powerful they are. How powerful they are. Okay, so. Here is another query. Now, in this query, what I am trying to do is I am giving a wild card. I should have to change. Like storage. So observe here, rest of the things are seen. But in that folder, in this folder, there may be multiple parkway files you know representing uh, sales data uh, hourly hourly sales data of this date this is 31st december uh, 2019 and there are multiple files representing hourly data okay and i want to read that whole data hourly data i want to read so there may be different file names what i will do i will ask it to read all the files. And there it will show me a same result, but in that result, I will see the records coming from not one file, but multiple files. So whenever you have your data, okay, with the multiple file names, the different file names, you, know, you can use a wildcard representation there. I'm putting this code to run to see. <coughs> Here it is. OK, now if I want to create it. OK, with another requirement. That I want to get all the files, all the parkway files, but for all the days of this month. For this month, there is a folder. Day is equal to 2019 December 31st. If there is a folder, day is equal to 2019. December 30, day is equal to 2019, December 
29. So in case if there are multiple such folders. OK, and we want it to refer to all the folders and from every folder, all the files. In that case, what I will have to ask it to do is. I can mention here asterisk. So thereby I am asking it to refer to all the folders. And from every folder, all the folders. OK, now here though we have a single folder, but still this will work. With execution of every query, you know, it is billing me. Yes, I am getting the data. What if I want to write this query for all the months? And for every day within every month and every hour within every day. In that case, then what I can do is here I can mention all the months. No, so it's not December only, but all the months. So I can mention asterisks, but remember here when I mention single asterisks, it will look for Parkway file within. Uh, uh, this folder only. OK, I can modify this query this way. So in case if I mention double asterisks, thereby I'm asking it to recursively search all folders, all subfolders, all sub subfolders. So double asterisk asterisks are re, uh, say, uh, referring to recursive lookup for all the files within given path. Here it will recursively look into all the sub all sub subfolders there and it will bring the data. Just a minute. We have to do this. Yes, perhaps. It is drinking that. OK, so there I remember there were questions in the examination regarding single asterisks, double asterisks. Uh, questions regarding you know, how can we mention asterisks there? What are all wildcard characters? That's why I just wanted this to cover. OK, go ahead and uh, bring more complexities. For OK, here you observe another. Q. Now let us see power of the query. What are all clauses can be used in the query? All these are the ad hoc queries what we are giving. And what it does is try to understand very interesting. That. It will go to the Parkway file. And it will. Uh, map the content of the Parkway file with a. Uh, you know schema given there. OK, here it is. Profit amount is one of the columns. Transaction date is another column. So here you can see. Profit amount. Is a column transaction date is a column. Uh, quantity is also should be a quantity is also a column. So here I am mentioning a projection. Here is a, I am mentioning a projection. OK, and I am referring to uh, rest of the things are same. OK, hereby I am asking you to group by. On. Uh, first level uh, group by on uh, transaction date and next level group by on product ID. So here you can see the power of the query that I can write you know aggregation within the query by declaring aggregation within the uh, projection area and I can ask it to even do group by order by you know those things also I can ask it to. OK, let me put it to run and let us see how does it give me the result or whether it is really giving me the result. Yes, it is giving me the result and see here. I am asking it to uh, do the aggregation and you know, that's why here it is giving me some of the profit average of the profit, some of the quantity. The aggregation also it is giving. So the query uh, are being executed on non queryable data storage. OK, so count. Count. So thereby we are giving the query. Now remember here, such type of you know querying. 
if we want to uh, run from the SQL script, that is possible. We can get the data. We can interactively work with the data. So where we need writing such queries, that's what I want to explain to you. We can interactively work with the data. We can use these queries in uh, 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 Spark code also. In Spark code, if we want to get this data, you know, such queries we can run there in the Spark code also. Whenever we are creating a data pipeline, now in case if you are coming from data factory background, so you are aware that in data, while creating a data pipeline, there also we may need to write a query to inject the data from maybe Parkway 5. And there also we have to write the queries. So writing these queries is not only needed for interactingly working with your data, but such queries can be written whenever you are um, writing the code in Spark. Such queries are to be written whenever you are creating a data pipeline. Okay, and thereby the data of the Parkway file can be made to reach to Spark food. It can be made to reach to data pipeline. It can be made to you know, interactively work with, and that is the significance of you know, uh, working with this data. OK, I think not every command I need to uh, work here. OK, couple of other commands. Uh, I can work here. OK, but I think. Uh, those commands we will try with. Uh, no, no, we will not try those commands with a dedicated SQL. OK, let me show you a couple of more commands to work with serverless SQL. Now here as of now, Every command that I have given is working on the uh, serverless SQL pool. OK, now um, what is the purpose of the master database? Master database, purpose of the master database basically is to you know, administrate your uh, data warehouse. OK, so here I am being a part of, I, I, uh, as a part of the administration. I wanted to create one database. So here I can ask it to create a database, create database, name of the database, and whatever with a collating sequence. OK, so hereby I can ask it to create a database. So I'm putting this command to run, and thereby it will create the database. OK, now it has created a database. OK, I can take you to the workspace. Uh, here it is not showing me the database. Or ideally, it should show me the name of the database. OK, for that purpose, what I do, whatever code I have written here in this script file, let me store that code. Let me save that code. So I will have to publish. Publishing means, you know, uh, 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 the, the code is committed. In the workspace, yes, the code is committed. So it has committed the code. OK, now let me refresh this page. So I can refresh the page from here, OK, to see name of the database. So it has to show me of the database. As we already have created it. Okay, so it is still. Uploading the page. Taking much longer time. It's taking so much longer time. I think still it is in process of creating the database. It's time it should increase the page. Let me close this portal and let me open the portal again. Maybe it is internet uh, issue. I don't know. Or I can refresh this page from here. Let me refresh whole page. Yeah. 
SQL database. See here, the database has already been created. OK, in this uh, database, you know, there are no tables as of now. OK, and this database we have created in serverless SQL pool. Remember, serverless SQL pool doesn't have storage. It doesn't have storage. So serverless SQL pool cannot store data. Serverless SQL pool may use workspace to store catalog. So here you will see whatever it is showing you is a catalog data. So external table, you know, uh, represents the schema. It does not represent data. External resources, views, so they represent schema. They do not represent data. Here also you will see users can be created and roles can be created. OK, so there can be you know restriction of on uh, access of uh, resources of serverless SQL pool. OK, and we can make it accessible to specific user or uh, for specific role. OK, so security is available on the serverless SQL pool. It stores a catalog here when I am creating the database. You know, this is external like database what it creates. External like means it doesn't store actual data. It stores. Uh, catalog of the data. It stores schema of the data. It stores metadata. But actual data it cannot store. So where actual data has gone? So that I already have shown to you the actual data has gone onto the primary storage here. It has gone onto the primary storage. Here we, we already have uploaded. So again, I repeat, your data has gone into the primary storage. But whenever you are creating the database, you know this database does not represent data. It represents only metadata. Yes. If I want to design some secondary storage, whether I can design. Yes, I can design a secondary storage also. I can design a secondary storage also. We'll design a secondary storage little later. OK, because I want to show you a couple of other steps. Here it is. I want to write a new uh, script file. OK, here two scripts we already. This is a uh, earlier script I wrote. OK, I can delete it. This is the script file we just uh, wrote and this script file you know, is working for the master database. I want to write another script file which I want to write the queries for the database that we have created. OK, so thereby I ask it to write a new script file. Here it is. OK, and there I want to connect this script file to not to the master database, but to the database that we have created. So hereby I can connect it to the database that I have created. OK, and on that data, I want to create a couple of objects couple of reusable objects. Now uh, study of these reusable objects is also important with respect to examination. OK, so what is this query? Let us see. If does not exist, select star from external file formats. Uh, where name create external file format. Here is the name given. OK, and format type park park. Now here, what is this? Let me tell you. Here actually is an arrangement to represent data of different formats. We know JSON format, we know XML format, we know CSV format, we know Parkway format. OK, but complexities do not end having the data type only or format type only. You know, within JSON also, there may be different polluting sequence types. 
देर में भी डिफरेंट डेलीमीटर कैरेक्टर्स एंड लाइन कैरेक्टर्स यू नो सो वी नीड टू क्रिएट ए डेटा फाइल फॉर्मेट एंड फॉर दैट पर्पज दे आर गिविंग मी अवे टू क्रिएट दैट ऑब्जेक्ट क्रिएट एक्सटर्नल फाइल फॉर्मेट ऑब्जेक्ट once i create a file format object i can use that object 100 times okay for the same data format i can use it wherever i want to deal with the same data so such type of objects you have to create once only okay these are reusable objects and these objects you cannot create on master you have to create them on the database only and that's why custom database i have created let me run this query this object got created okay this external file format object got created let me show you how it has created external refresh external resources external file format see here that object got created so this is one file format object now let me uh, write another query create another object external data source external data source object external data source object you know represents the path to the file or represents the uh, storage where that file is existing okay here i have to mention name of the data storage okay name of the data storage is uh, name of the data storage is chandra sy nsdl let me mention that name here chandra sy nsdl dfs this is primary storage that's why dfs okay and same name i can change this name this is very long name let me make it short Okay, and i may not have so long name dfs word i will leave to know that you know this data source is representing uh, data on the primary storage okay and same i will have to change uh, or this name i can mention Yes. <clears throat> yes. I am putting this code to run. This is going to create one data source. Okay. And again, wherever I want to refer to this data source, I will use this object. So this object also got created. Its name is WWI hyphen zero two and something. You know, here it has been. Okay. Let me refresh it. okay so data source so see i am taking an opportunity to introduce to you these different objects also because these objects are very important as far as the context of examination is concerned okay these objects are really important okay then i am creating external table here it is And while creating external table, okay, remember here. Let me close this. Okay, I will have to do some changes here because here now I have changed this name, name of the data source. Okay, inside the query, you will mention the name of the data source. So inside hundreds of queries, you can mention name of the same data source. So data source is representing. location to the uh, file data file okay not only that this is the primary data file so i don't have to mention an authentication details here but otherwise there are uh, arrangements to you know define here authentication details so the data source object external data source object you know whenever we create it it represents all authentication details it helps in connecting to that data source and 
it also represents a location. So it helps in reaching to the actual file. So what is the purpose of external data source? Purpose of the external data source is to, uh, you know, carry a whole information, every necessary information to connect to the external data source and uh, reach to the actual data file. Okay. So hereby I'm asking it to, you know, use this file format. Again, file format is another object we created here. And that about, about that also I told you that you created once and when you want to use the same file format, you know, every time you can use it. Okay, these, uh, you know, definitions I have made simple. In reality, these definitions will be complex in the sense that, you know, there are multiple things you may have mentioned. Like here, data for representing the data, collating sequence, uh, delimiter characters, inline characters, and many such things are mentioned. And thereby, these definitions will become complex. So just to declare that complexity at one place, that is object creation uh, they are giving. Let us run this. Okay, your data source is already referring to uh, the path up to the content. Okay, so here you have to refer the path uh, relative to the uh, container. Okay, and that's why. Now let me run this query. This query is asking it to create an external table. So what do you mean by external table? And how it is different than database table? So this external table, you know, it has also created. And here under this, you will see that external table. Here it is. It has been created. External table means here inside this database, only schema is represented. See, only schema is represented. Actual data is not there. Actual data is still in Parkway file. Actual data is still in Parkway. So this Parkway file is on the storage. Actual data is on the storage, but schema is in the workspace. So here you can see that schema. Okay, such tables you know, for whom the schema and the data, they are not existing together. But schema is inside the workspace and actual data is somewhere else. So such tables are called as an external table. There is an opposite of external table, we call it the managed tables. And your RDBMS systems, database systems, they represent managed tables, where your data and schema both go together. So the manager This is external table. The table got created here. Now you can query this table. How you will query C? Select star from table name. See how you can make your queries further simple. I am hoping to run it. So how it will bring the data? Try to understand how it will bring the data. This query will refer to the scheme. Schema is already there inside the workspace, inside the database. OK, so it will read that schema. It will go to this file. It will bring data from this file. It will map the data from the file to the schema. And here it is showing you actual data in the tabular form. So this data is actually coming from par Parkway. But the data from the Parkway file is being mapped with a column uh, structure and it is being shown to you uh, in the tabular form exactly in the same way. Uh, how does it show you data when you query uh, database tables? That's how. Okay, so this query again you can use in uh, Spark tool while writing a PySpark notebook. You can use it in uh, data factory. I mean to say Synapse pipeline. Okay, is the data there? Okay, you can use such query to interactively work with the data. But here. All these queries are getting executed on serverless SQL. Okay, and serverless SQL pool can, uh, it is basically for 
know, running your queries, okay, on the external tables. It's basically for running your queries on the external tables. Your data is in uh, non-queryable format. Now here it is a parquet file, but believe me, we can write such queries for CSV data, for JSON data, and such queries can be uh, fetching the data uh, from the JSON file, from CSV file, but showing you that data in the tabular form, the way you see uh, table structure in case of relational database management. Still. Wherever you want that data, you don't have to you know, ask it to go to the parquet file and write such type of, uh, you know, code, okay, or a complex code of PySpark. You can just ask it to run that query to fetch the data. But I'm publishing. <clears throat> Any question on whatever I have covered up till now? Please go ahead with your questions. I have got some questions. Huh. Now let me come to answering your questions. Can you summarize benefits of dedicated SQL? Yes. Dedicated. Although we are planning to discuss dedicated as well post lunch session, uh, but still now you have asked me the question. Let me just uh, list out uh, the benefits. Dedicated as well. Okay. It represents a data warehouse. Data warehouse. Data warehouse basically is for massive parallel processing. Massive parallel What is the architecture of this massive parallel processing and how it is different than you know database architecture that I will discuss you know, post lunch? But this massive parallel processing, you know, basically it is for com running complex analytical queries. Complex analytical queries. There are multiple servers here. Here you get a cluster of the uh, servers. OK, and how uh, it runs the queries that it runs the queries in every server. OK, but on different data sets, and that's why data set processing uh, happens faster. So queries are complex. Data is very large in size. For large and very large data sets. So because of which, what happens is the response time is com less compared to, you know, similar type of query if you try to run on the database. OK, so performance is definitely uh, better here. OK, so that is about a data warehouse. It is RDBMS system, Renational Database Management System. OK, so it is a data warehouse. It is for analytical uh, processing. OK, representing structured data, representing structured data. Now in dedicated SQL pool, you get further better performance. The reason is your data goes column, column wise. It's a column storage. Column storage. OK. It allows you different sharding uh, mechanism. Sharding mechanism is how data gets distributed. Remember, data if you keep at one place, and if that data is too large, you know, then it becomes difficult to process that data. Okay, but if you distribute the data across the servers, okay, so maybe there is a 15 GB of data. 5 GB of data if you are storing in one server, 5 GB in another server, 5 GB in Third server. And then if you are processing, in that case, what will happen is that whenever you are dividing your data across the three servers, you know, the query execution on all this data 
will be completed in one third time also. So in distributed processing, you get a performance benefit and the larger data also gets processed in short span of time. So RDBM is representing structured data, column storage. Okay, distributed processing, uh, massive parallel processing I already have uh, mentioned there. Okay, uh, large data, large data size. Okay, this data size is, it can process data too large to be accommodated in one database. Okay, if so data is so large that perhaps one database is not sufficient, but such a large data you can process in dedicated scale. So I don't today what is happening is your businesses are growing and they are getting much more data. So business data of very large size, it is for business data of very large size for analytical. There is its purpose. OK. Any other question? Folder path needs to be pasted in SQL query to reference. No, I did not get that question. That uh, folder path was, uh, you know, very long, and that's why I copy paste it. But otherwise, if I want to, I want it to create uh, uh, that, uh, you know, script. It can, it can auto generate a script for me. How Parkway ORC files are read, read by query. Any example? Ah, I told you uh, the steps. No? Let me take you back to that. Uh, here in this example, see here we have created this table. This table is simply representing schema. It is simply representing the schema. OK, it is simply representing this location. You know, whenever we are creating the table, you know, at that time, it does not uh, bring the data into the table. It simply creates a schema. Simply creates a schema. And simply refers to the path. Uh, sorry, simply record the path. Okay, actual data it will bring whenever you run the select query. Whenever you are running the select query, at that time what it does is it refers to the schema, which is there inside the uh, table. Then at that time it goes to the file. Up till now it hasn't gone to the file. Up till now it doesn't know even that file is existing there or not. But whenever you are running the query, then it goes to that file. It brings the data from the file. It maps that data with this schema and it presents data and the schema. For every select query, it will follow these steps. It will refer to the schema. It will bring the data from the file. Data from the file, it will map to the schema and it will show you map data in the tabular form. These steps it will follow for while executing every. Any other question? Yes, but Parkway is one big column. How it is? Uh, how is the schema designed? OK, OK. Now let me. Parkway has a column storage. It is not a one big column. Okay, what are all columns here? Let me just see. Customer ID, transaction ID, customer ID. Okay, so how Parkway file represents the data, let us see. Parkway file. Customer ID, right? Transaction ID and customer ID. Transaction ID. This is the first column. Now, what is the, how Parkway will uh, Parkway file will represent his data? So, first transaction ID, second transaction ID, third transaction ID. So that way 
you know all transaction ids it will represent as a one and a first row all 1000 transaction ids in case if there are 1000 records all 1000 transaction id it will represent one after another so whenever it has to read this column you know it has to read this column until um, all the values until second column begins second column is here second column is here customer so all these values it will read okay uh, as a part of reading the data of the first column but while showing this data on the in the tabular form c transaction id customer id product id it means it is showing the data row wise but while representing the data into parquet file it will represent data in column wise means all the values of transaction id as the first row all the values of customer id as a second row so all customer id is there to 2,2,2, all the customers. That's how Parquet file represents the data. At the beginning of the Parquet file, there is always a kind of a table. You know, that table represents the position of every column in that file. Okay, so transaction ID. And it will mention the position. Okay, so its position. Then customer ID. So thereby, you know what it will do? It will refer to this table as an index to reach to a specific column, and it will reach to that specific column immediately, and will read uh, uh, that uh, that column as a row, and it will get all the values of that. That's how you know Parquet packet. Uh, key difference between Parquet and ORC. They are they are by different vendors. ORC is by different vendor, Parquet is by different vendor. Uh, another key difference is uh, different encryption techniques they are using. Different encryption techniques they are using. Uh, so, uh, you know, besides that, you know, both these vendors are claiming their data formats are more uh, performance uh, oriented. Okay. Because of indexing, is Parquet called binary format? No. Every value that Parkway stores there, like these values, you know what Parkway will store there, it will be in binary form. It will be in binary form. Okay, that is one thing. And then, you know, in order to reach to uh, uh, the data, you know, faster, there are indexes also. You know, indexes are also generated there, you know, and those indexes uh, help it to reach to the specific data. Uh, faster. Okay, so but that index is not related to Parkway file. That indexing is related to whenever that data comes into the memory, that time then indexes are created. Not in the Parkway file. There is no index inside Parkway. But whenever that data is brought from the Parkway file into the memory, you know, then indexes are generated. Whenever that data is uploaded to the cluster, partitioned into the cluster inside every partition, then it creates the index. <laughs> is the Synapse SQL uh, database? No, it is, uh, I told you, no. Synapse is a data warehouse system. Synapse is a big data analytics system. Synapse is, uh, and it also can be, uh, it also has a feature to orchestrate, uh, create orchestration. So it is a you know, one stop solution for many things. So it's not a database. Difference between primary versus in SQL Synapse. Primary database and uh, block database you mean. Okay, that I will cover post uh, lunch. Okay, we will also uh, work with the secondary storage. Try to work with the secondary storage box. For primary, major difference is, you know, for primary, it doesn't have to authenticate itself repeatedly. For secondary, it will have to authenticate itself repeatedly. Okay, that is a major difference. Okay, so that's all from my side.
I think it is a time for us to take a uh, lunch break now before I begin uh, another topic. Okay, so let us take a logical break. For how much time do you suggest we should take a lunch break? Let's resume session by one hour. Okay, so 2.30, 2.30 p.m. So we will resume our session by 2.30. Okay, so, so uh, let us join the session uh, uh, sharp 2.30. Okay, and in the post lunch session, I will take you to the dedicated SQL pool. I will uh, somewhere I will also explain you uh, the secondary storage. We will also try to understand Spark pool and we will also try to uh, visit uh, create data pipeline. Yes. So I will increase the pace in the second half. You know, I believe all the fundamental things by this time you are aware of. You know, so I will have to increase a little bit space uh, to touch to many topics. I will go on the mute now and I will unshare the screen. We will resume our session live. Anybody has any question in the meantime? You please putting your questions in the chat. I will uh, uh, revert to those questions. Okay, post lunch session. 